First, I'd like to thank Gerda, Francois, and Nigel for a nice introduction to this course. I'm going to touch some of the things that were mentioned in Gerda's lecture, but I think that many other people are also going to touch things that she can present. It. So you may think that there's some overlap, but but there's no really way around it. So I'm going to talk about things that happened before the formation of the solar system, and I'm going to touch also the question about the formation of the solar system and, and also about the Earth. <clears throat> okay, the contents of my talk are going to be elements and the molecules that are important for life, Big Bang, creation of uh, hydrogen and helium, then we'll discuss the very first stars, and the first heavy elements, the first full generation of stars, uh, and the formation of, of, of the CNOPS. Then we'll discuss interstellar clouds shortly, uh, and their dust and grains, and then we're going to go through the topic that we are made of stars and stardust. And finally, I'll show you the biological HR diagram. Okay, elements of light. We know what light is when we see it, at least in most cases. It can be also really tiny. Most of life is small. Uh, this is from our living room, from, from a flower pot. Lots of bacteria growing. If you look at life, in general, it has, it has many characteristics that are common to all of life we know. First of all, it has some molecules that are common, water, nucleic acids, amino acids, lipids, and carbohydrates, uh, like in the cytoplasm of cell, DNA, RNA, proteins, membranes, and sugar and starch. And, and you can look on the right, you can see the, the most common elements, and you can see some repetition there. You can see C in many places, and H, and N, and O and P and S. So only a handful of elements. The precursors to these molecules are believed to be water, formaldehyde, hydrogen cyanide, and various kinds of sugars, and, and hydrocarbons. These are things that are going to be touched by the forthcoming lectures. I'm not, I'm not going to go into, into detail about these precursors. These are just common things that are going to lead to life. Kirsi and others are going to tell how. If you look at the elements, six most important elements are CHNOPS. Nice acronym, SNOPS, easy to remember. Makes up to 98% of living tissue. Then there's 2%, the rest of it is made from a number of trace elements, so sodium, chlorine, potassium, fluoride, calcium, magnesium, iron, and so on, a pretty long list. Uh, a total of about 25, 30 elements are used by life, and about 30 are not. At least they're not, not common in any sense. So you can see that the the number of elements needed by life is, is quite limited. It's about one third or one fourth of the available elements. Okay, let's go back in time about 13.7 billion years to the Big Bang. The universe has a microwave background which is uniform. The picture on, on the top right shows really how uniform it is. It has a temperature of about 2.7 kelvins. If you take out the average of this uniform background, you are left with a background which looks like a dipole. There's a hotter part and there's a cooler part. Note that this variation is very small. It's about tenth of a percent of, of the microwave background. And this is three millikelvins, whereas that was close to three kelvins. This is a dipole component, and it comes from the Earth and the Sun moving into a certain direction in the sky. If you take out this dipole component, then you're left with something that looks 
looks like a red band that goes across the sky and then other patches that are slightly darker and, and, and slightly slightly hotter. And the variation here is on the levels of millikelvin, so, so sorry, microkelvin, so about one billion millionth of, of the microwave background. So very smooth microwave background with tiny variations in it. Also, this red stuff here is from our galaxy, our own home galaxy. And if you take out that home galaxy contribution, you are left out with this kind of a picture. This shows the whole sky. The plane of the galaxy in this is in the center. You don't see it anymore because it has been subtracted. And this is kind of the residual that is left at the level of, of microkelvin. It's really small variations. But what this tells about is what the universe was about 13.7 billion years ago, when the age of the universe was only 380,000 years old. So very young universe. And this tells about the temperature fluctuations in that universe. It can also be interpreted as, as the mass fluctuations in that universe. And from this data, which is from the Wilkinson microwave anisotropy map, we can get an age of the universe, which is 13.73 billion years old, and a critical density, which means that the universe is flat, which is equal, uh, the mean density is equal to a critical density. Okay. So the universe is quite a nice looking place to live in. The geometry is simple because because it's a flat universe. Now, if you study these fluctuations, it turns out that the universe has an interesting property, and which is that, that there's lots of dark energy. We don't know what this dark energy is. The content of the universe is about three-fourths dark energy and, and one-fourth dark mass. We have some idea about the dark mass. We can see its influence in gravitation. The dark energy shows up as acceleration of the universe at the present time. All visible matter is, is in helium, hydrogen, and, and then heavier elements. The heavier elements are a really narrow strip here that, that we don't really see. And this makes up 4% of, of the universe. So. Most of the stuff when we talk about universe is, is only 4% and, and life is here even in a much more narrow strip, much less than one pixel wide. So all the elements forming life are in a narrow strip and life itself is even narrower. Okay, first two elements, hydrogen and helium, were formed in the Big Bang. The universe was hot and dense and opaque at the beginning. Protons started to form when the universe had a temperature of about 12, 10 to 12 kelvins. It's extremely hot. And this was about one tenth of a millisecond from the beginning. Right from the start, the universe started cooling. And alpha particles, which are helium cores, start to form when the temperature has fallen down to about 100 million kelvins, and this is about 100 seconds from the beginning. It keeps on going for another about 100 seconds, and during that time, 16 protons form one alpha particle, and the 12 remaining protons are left as such. This means that we're going to get a mass of three-fourths of hydrogen and one-fourth of helium, so these are mass ratios. And this is what we observe about in the present day universe. We also get tiny amounts of, of heavier elements, which astronomers call metals. Anything heavier than helium is, is a metal for an astronomer. But these are, these are very small amounts. Note that we're not getting any carbon or oxygen, because for those to form, we would need to go back to a hotter universe. And it's not possible because the universe keeps on cooling all the time. So they have to be formed at a later stage. Surface of, of the last scattering is, is the one we see in the microwave background. And 
we see this at the time when the universe becomes transparent. So the photons or the microwave background have traveled from that time to our telescopes. This is seen both in the Kobe and Wilkinson microwave and an isotropy map and also in the, in the Planck satellite, which is right now measuring uh, similar kind of data and we should hear about it more in detail in, in about a year or two. There has been some data released already, but, but the full image is still from the uh, Wilkinson microwave anisotropy map. It happened at the age of the universe of 380,000 years and the redshift was about uh, 1100 and the temperature of the universe at that time was about 3000 kelvins. So a little bit cooler than, than the sun's surface. Around the same time of the last scattering, the protons combine with electrons and, and proper hydrogen is formed and alpha particles combine with electrons also, and they make helium. At that time, there were no stars and no galaxies. So only helium and, and hydrogen clouds were around. Then the very, very first stars start to form. So clouds start kind of collapsing. These very first stars have not been found yet, but we astronomers are, are looking for them. The idea here is that after two to four hundred billion years of dark ages, these clouds, helium and, and hydrogen clouds start to collapse. And some of these stars are believed to be very large, 150 to 500 solar masses. There are also models that, that suggest that smaller stars also formed at the, at the time. These big stars were short-lived and they lived a hot life. So their life was over in about a million years, which is a very short time. And the temperature of the surface was about 100,000 kelvins. These were the fir very first stars, were the ones that produced the first heavy elements, like carbon and oxygen. At this time, there were no galaxies yet around. So, so the universe was quite different from the present one. Here's a picture of, of the Andromeda galaxy and, and, and two dwarf galaxies that are all orbiting, orbiting the galaxy. Okay. The first generation of ordinary stars start to form, and these become the real factories of, of, the, of the metals, the C-H-N-O-P-S, the elements that we need for life. Now, the, this first generation of ordinary stars are called population two stars. Stars come in different sizes. They're bigger stars and they're smaller stars. All of these stars are spheres, basically spheres of hot helium and hydrogen plasma. Population two stars have very small amounts of, of heavier elements and these come from earlier stars and population three stars. If the star is a bigger star, more massive, then the center of the star has a higher pressure, which means that the temperature at the center is hotter. This in turn means that the nuclear reactions in the center are faster, and it means that the life is shortened. So big stars burn out quickly, and small stars can persist much longer. This is what is called the HR diagram. Uh, you can read this in many ways. Here's the effective temperature of the star. Or you can also read the spectral class. Or get an idea of the color. Blue color. Blue means hot for stars. And red means cool. On the vertical axis, you have the brightness of the star either in magnitude or in luminosity. So this is, note that this is a logarithmic scale. Most of the stars form, fall on the main sequence, which goes across here. And the sun is right there in the center. So hot stars in the main sequence are up here. They're more massive. They have also a bigger radius, radius of about 100, and these live a short life. 
On the other side, red and brown dwarfs are small stars. They are cool from the center, and they live much longer lives. The life of our sun, our sun is right now about 5 billion years old, and it's expected to last another 5 billion years. Okay. If we look at some numbers here from the left to the right, this is in the same sequence as in the HI diagram. So the blue stars on the left are O0 and A0 spectral class. And then the red dwarfs are on the right, M0 and M7 class. And the stars in the center are, are solar type. If you look at the mass of the star, you can see that from going from O to M, the star mass goes from about 30 to about 0 0.1, and the temperature from about 4,000. 4, this is the effective temperature on the surface, not in the core. From 44,000 down to about 2,800. Our sun is this G, G2. And then the age goes from about 5 million years up to a huge number of 10 trillion years. So these numbers here are bigger than the age of the universe. So these stars, when they form, they are still around, whereas these stars have have gone. I mean, there are some that are forming now, and they're not going to last in the sky for a long time. But now for life to form, we should have something that stays around at least 2 billion years. 10 billion years is better, at least for, for so-called higher creatures like we are. 30 billion years could be also fine. So the main sequence starts from about spectral class F to M is sort of good for life. So if I go back one side from F to M, so this range here is good for life. These stars are too short-lived and these stars are going to have other problems. We're not going to go into those other problems at this point. This point, when uh, habitable zones are going to be discussed in this course, these details will be brought up. Okay, stars. Here's just a picture of, of a observatory at, at La Silla, a place where where planetary systems are are found in, in good numbers. Okay, what happens inside a star? You know. Solar type star, less than one and a half. Solar masses, the central temperature of the star is between 4 million and 70 million Kelvin. Helium is formed by what's called a proton proton reaction. So you have hydrogen turning into helium. In more massive stars, larger than that, 1.5, uh, solar mass, the central temperature is, is higher, it's more than 17 million Kelvin, and helium is now formed by a more effective way, which is called the carbon cycle. One property of the carbon cycle is, is that carbon is a catalyst, but as a side product, some nitrogen and oxygen are formed. This is kind of important for us that, that these two elements are also formed in, in these stars. In most stars that are larger than 0 0.26 solar mass, after the hydrogen in the core is fused into helium, the core collapses. So the core kind of falls on itself, becomes denser, and the temperature of the core rises. When the temperature hits 100 million Kelvin, a reaction which is called the triple alpha reaction begins. And in this reaction, three helium nuclei become a carbon nucleus. So note that we're here we're forming carbon, and here we're forming nitrogen and oxygen. Later on, when the helium is consumed, core collapses again and becomes even denser. And if the temperature is over 500 million kelvins, then we start forming new reactions with carbon plus carbon, forming oxygen and helium, and then we get side products of, of other metals, magnesium, sodium, and neon. 
and then heavier elements form in, in, in the large stars. For example, oxygen plus oxygen gives sulfur, phosphorus, silicon, magnesium, and then silicon plus silicon. Let's see. Silicon plus silicon gives uh, nickel and iron. So in ordinary stars, you can get up to about iron. Elements even heavier than iron can form in small amounts by what's called a snow, slow neutron capture. And in supernovae, uh, heavier elements are formed by a rapid neutron capture. So these are two, two different kind of processes. Note that in, in elements heavier than helium, the atom masses divisible by four are in general the more common ones. We're going to see a table of, of these atom masses and we can see the cycle of four. Now, you have all, all these elements formed in a star and then somehow you, can, you should get them out into space. None of the tiniest stars have evolved yet from the main sequence, so their elements are still inside the star. Medium-sized stars will develop an onion -like structure with carbon or ox oxygen in the core, and then the stars will blow the outer envelope as a stellar wind. And the core is going to form finally a white dwarf and a, and a planetary nebula. Large stars will develop also an onion-like structure starting with uh, hydrogen on the top and then going in heavier, heavier elements into a core. If it gets an iron core, then it may blow up as a supernova, and, and this may co cause a com complete destruction of the star. And that would be one good way of, of distributing these, these heavier elements in the space. The core of such a supernova can collapse into a black hole or a, or a neutron star. That's also a possibility. So, for small stars, you get the planetary nebula with a white dwarf in the center. And in this gas cloud, you are going to get most, mostly still hydrogen and helium, but it's going to be contaminated with these important elements, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. And now this matter is being spread into the interstellar space. In a supernova, you get the same elements, but you also get the heavier elements like silicon and iron. And actually, all, all other elements that we know of get spread into a space. Supernovas can be caused by exploding stars, but they can also be caused by colliding white dwarfs or colliding neutron stars. These are alternative ways of, of making a supernova explosion and distributing this material into the space. So this is a supernova explosion in, in Taurus, and it's called the Crab Nebula. OK, all these heavy elements are now distributed into interstellar space. In this interstellar space, gas and dust starts to form clouds. In our galaxy, about 10% of the mass of the galaxy is in stars. 90% is, is dark matter. And general distribution of, of elements is, is three-fourths hydrogen and one-fourth helium, and about 1% 1 of, of heavier elements. In our galaxy, we can find these cores of giant molecular clouds, such as the Orion cloud, or in Sagittarius, these are, the cores are very cold, 10 to 20 Kelvin. They are dense in astronomical sense, 10 to 9 particles per cubic meter. It's, it's still very thin stuff. I mean, we, no, we will not feel it as, we would feel it as vacuum. Uh, new stars form in these kind of uh, GMCs, and they are rare molecule factories. So here's, here's one picture of the Orion Nebula, invisible light. Uh, we can see this nebula. There's also parts up here and, and fate nebulas there on all over the picture. 
we can see this brightly because of, of four young stars in front of the nebula that are that are shining the cloud. Now this cloud is actually very big. It would extend over the roof of your room and go through the floor on the other other side. Uh, if we look into this nebula in infrared, this is what we see. This is the central part. These are the bright stars in the center. But we see a lot of stars that are forming there, newborn stars. This is at, at two micrometers. And it tells us that inside the star, there's a factory of stars. We cannot see through the cloud in visible light, but we can see through it in infrared. So this is taken with the with the ESO, ESO telescopes in, in Chile. What do you find here? You, you find molecules, not that many of these are now important for, for life, like formaldehyde, hydrogen, cyanide, and water. These were mentioned earlier on in the lecture. There's also lo lots of carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and, and methane found, found in these clouds. So these are some of the simple important molecules that we see there. Of course, we see a lot of H2 also. That's the most common common molecule. But the second one is on, on CO, CO2, and water. We can see also hydrocarbons and, and carbon chains. We can see simple sugars, glycolaldehyde. And the longest molecule so far is, is a long carbon chain. A total of about 150 to nearly 200 molecules have been detected in these clouds. There are bound to be more complex clouds, but the problem in detecting those is that their spectra are very hard to identify. And when you have longer uh, molecules with more atoms in them, they become naturally less common. So, so this is kind of a limit set by, by the detection methods. Out, out of the detected 150 or so molecules, one fourth is without carbon and three fourths are with carbon. This is quite interesting because carbon is, is one of the key ingredients for, for life. These molecules form partially on dust, like H2 appears to require dust, or some of them form in, in free space. One percent of the mass in a giant molecule cloud is dust. It's not quite the same as, as room dust, but, it, but it's more like, like finely ground sand that you see in the springtime on, on Finnish roads that, that just stays in the sky when, when cars drive, drive by. This, these particles are elongated, they're small in size, from about 0 0.1 micrometers to 1 micrometer. And the density of this dust is about 1 particle per million cubic meters. So, it's not very dense, but it's, it's still kind of important. These dust particles are partially water ice, silicates, and possibly graphite. These are detected by spectroscopy in, in infrared. Temperature of the, of the dust is cold, 10 to 20 Kelvin, so it doesn't move much and it doesn't move rapidly. And in general, dust is, is observed by scattering of light, optical light. Reddening in optical light, that means that, that red color gets through a dust cloud better than blue color. Polarization properties, if the dust particles are aligned, then only light that is that oscillates in, in the same direction as, as the light gets through. And then thermal infrared radiation is also detected from this dust where you can where you can measure the spectrum of the dust cloud and get its temperature. So in many ways, we can see the presence of, of dust and, and ice in, in these giant molecular clouds. OK, the ingredients that are formed in, in the stars and are found in the dust clouds 
that are important for us for the formation of life in the future are, are first of all hydrogen and helium that's important for forming stars and, and like our sun hydrogen helium and oxygen for giant planets uh, H and O is important because that's the way you form water and water appears to be important for formation of giant planets at least in our solar system then you can find silicon, silicon uh, aluminium, uh, magnesium, iron, and, and uh, nickel, and these are important for rocky planets. Uh, the Schnapps elements are important for life. And then you find different molecules which are important for the formation of life on planets. And you can find dust, which is important for planets and life. So you can see that all, all the necessary things were slowly kind of pulling them together. Now, slowly going into a formation of, of the sun and the, and the earth, <clears throat> what does a forming star look like? It looks like this. These are from the Orion Nebula to protoplanetary disks. You have the star in the center here, it glows slightly as red. So the star is inside this disk. This is the disk which is viewed from the side. It's black because it's optically thick. It has dust and it has gas in it. There's another one where the star has brightened up a, li a little bit, but it still shows, shows the disk around the star. These are new born stars that are in the process of, of, of birth and the planetary system in, in these around these stars is also uh, being born at this time. More disks in the same cloud, Orion cloud, but now viewed from the top, you can see the shape of the disk and, and the newly born star in the, in the center. So they look like circular or if viewed from the side, slightly from the side, they are elliptical and, and the star in the center here. So, uh, I guess Eva is going to talk more in detail about the formation of, of the, of the protoplanetary disks and, and, and the planetary systems. So I'm not going to go in great detail into these. Properties of, of the solar accretion disk, we get the age from meteorites by studying the radioactive elements in meteorites and the age of, of the present of our, our solar system is 4.567 or 4.568 billion years before present. This is nice to have a seven year because it's easy to remember. Uh, matter forming the sun and the planets form a thin disk around what's going to be the star and it settles into a central plane. This is what we saw in the previous images. Temperature is greater towards the center of the accretion disk. That's where the star will form and also towards the plane. Planetesimals, these are the progenitors of planets, start to grow first by sticking to each other when they are smaller than, than a few meters, first, first starting from the dust, dust particles and then growing bigger to meters. And then once, once they reach a size of a few hundred kilometers, then gravitation starts to uh, play a role. The largest of, of the planets go, go into a runaway growth like, the, uh, like Jupiter and Saturn when, when they reach a size when their core reaches the size of about 10 Earth masses, they just start to eat anything they find, find around. So they, they collect all the comets and asteroids that come too close to them. Of course, this happens by gravitation, but, but uh, you can kind of say that they eat everything around them. Okay, at a distance of about 4 to 5 AU from the Sun, astronomical units, uh, this 4 to 5 is about at the distance where Jupiter is formed. There's an area which is called the snow line. Inside this snow line, 
Uh, there's no liquid water or icy water, so all water kind of gets gets uh, evaporated. Beyond the snow line, comets survive. The water in the comet survives. So, so you have difference here. Inside this, you get asteroids, and beyond this, you get comets. Now, the formation of, of the Earth and the rocky planets of the inner solar system was possible uh, because of the heavy, heavy elements formed, formed in previous stars. And the timing of this whole process of, of the formation of the solar system is very quick. So Earth happened, Earth was formed about the same time as, as the whole solar system. There are variations maybe of a few tens of millions of years, but, but that's a that's small variation. Earth was accreted from matter, which was about 700 to monoxide and no water or any gases. They were all thrown out of the central parts of the accretion disk. And but how do we have water here? Big that it was maybe maybe ten times larger than the Earth, and that was most composed of, of hydrogen. When the temperature fell enough down to about 200 degrees Celsius, a rain began, and all the water in the atmosphere drained down, and oceans formed. So oceans formed quite quite early on when the temperature fell fell enough. So after, okay, at that carbon dioxide and, and carbon monoxide and, and nitrogen. So this was the first, first Earth, the first ocean. Slowly, land started forming in the form of volcanoes and and. At that time, the atmosphere was something different. Past uh, asteroids, and this is a picture of, of the asteroid Ida and its moon Dactyl. Small moon here in Ida. We can look at the moon. Nice romantic moon, full moon. You can, I mean, different nations see different things, maidens or, or, or bad faces in the moon, or usually nice faces. They have no water in them. And they're all impact craters that were filled by lava. The formation of this kind of crater, if it had happened on Earth, we can calculate from the number we see in the moon, from the number of these big craters, we can calculate that some of the big ones have definitely happened on the Earth, and some of these could have evaporated all the oceans. They had so much energy. So the early times on Earth were very violent. But, but during these times, when asteroids and comets hit the Earth, although they had this destructive power in them, they were also important in bringing down the necessary ingredients for life to form. Asteroids formed inside the snow line. They brought us silicates, iron, and nickel. So kind of rock-like ingredients. Also carbon and water came with asteroids. So some asteroids have up to, or meteorites have up to 4% of, of carbon and, and water up to 20%. Amino acids and complex molecules have been found, for example, on, 
on the Merkinson meteorite. So, so these are also found in space. And the largest asteroid, Ceres, which is also classified as a as a minor, as a dwarf planet, appears to be differentiated. So it has a heavy heavier core in the center, and it seems to have a very large amount of, of water in it, maybe up to 25 percent. Ceres, Vesta, and Pallas, the, the largest of the asteroids, are thought to be remnants of planetesimals. So, so this kind of shows that, that the planetesimals, the asteroids, brought us water, amino acids, complex molecules, iron and nickel, and carbon and water. So you can see you're starting to get all the important ingredients that, that you need for life. You can also look at the comets. One of the interesting things about comets is that we have the uh, European Space Agency has, has this Rosetta mission, which is going to visit a comet uh, starting in 2014, and it's going to uh, almost literally park around the comet and follow it for a year and a half. And after that, we're going to know much more about comets. It's going to be, it's really going to be a very interesting mission. But up to now, we know that the uh, we know about the comets that, that heaviest bombardment of comets and asteroids lasted for about 800 million years from the beginning. And these comets, the so asteroids were dealt in the previous slide, and, and comets are dealt here. So comets formed behind the snow line. The water was not evaporated from them. And the comets contain significant amounts of, of water, carbon dioxide, and other ices. We know this from earthbound spectroscopy and, and also from about uh, 30 missions that have, that have passed comets, albeit at, at quite high velocities. So, so comets have the same molecules that can be found in interstellar clouds and that are also important for life. So they are kind of the carriers of, of life in, in one sense. They appear to have brought enough of water to the Earth to form the oceans and also enough of nitrogen for the atmosphere. The asteroids could not have had nitrogen in them in any significant amount because nitrogen is also a, a volatile molecule. Okay, here's here's a couple of comets that have been seen nearby from from Vil two. We got some some samples in the in the R gels, but but really looking for the Rosetta mission. That's that's going to bring I think much more information than all these previous ones combined. Okay, here's a picture of, of Common Temple one, where a deep impact uh, took place place on the comets and, and and some interesting carbonates were, were found and, and olivine was found and and also signs of signs signs of big landslides. Quite an interesting case. Okay. We know this comet material is falling down to Earth, partially from the direct impacts but also also from smaller dust. The noctilucent clouds that you can see in Finland in the summertime when auroras are not visible up here. These are found at, at a height of about 85%. Earlier this year, this was it was shown that at least half of this ice that's in these noctilucent clouds comes from micrometeorites. So here we see kind of micrometeorite stuff that is slowly on its way down to Earth. It brings similar material to the Earth as, as the comets and asteroids do. Not much is known about this micrometeorite. About half of these micrometeorites float to Earth non-destructively, so, so they come really, really like a drizzle rain, really slowly, like feathers falling from the sky. The flux is quite continuous, about one micrometeorite per square meter per day. 
any dust that you have on Earth. Antarctica is a good place to study these. Okay, as Gerda mentioned earlier, where the sun is a typical star, you can see the elements from the Big Bang. And then from here, you have the scarce lithium, beryllium, and, and borium. From here, this comes from the helium. Cycle of four up to up to the formation of iron and nickel. So this is what you get in stars, and then all these other things are from supernovae. So any precious metals come from supernovae. If you look at the actual elements, you can see that if you compare the bacteria, mammals, interstellar medium, and comets, it's quite amazing how similar numbers are in all of these in all of these columns. I mean, you can explain it by by the amount of water in bacteria, mammals, and interstellar medium and, and comets. So that's about two to one. But then you have also carbon. And look at mammals and comets: ten percent bacteria, six percent ISM, ten thirteen percent. So they're almost within measurement errors. Nitrogen is on a level of one two percent all the way through. And then these rarer uh, life needing life elements, uh, sulfur and, and phosphorus, they're they're quite low, but you still find them in, in interstellar medium and, and in the comets. So I, I find this kind of quite quite nice to see that although although we're children or stars, it's also in interstellar medium which which has played a critical role in getting all this stuff into into us and all the bacteria that are living under our, our fingernails. Same stuff, basically. OK, the biological HR diagram. Where can life be found? On Earth, we have life. We know that pretty much for fact. So we have a sun, and the distance is 1 AU. Now, using these conditions and also making a few assumptions that the environment has to be stable for a long enough time. Conditions have to be suitable. You, you get it from the from having a sun in the center and from the distance. You can calculate the reasonable temperature. And assuming an Earth-like world, you can take your HI diagram and, and look at it. So, so the blue area. Here is too hot for life. In the red area here, you run into a problem which is called the tidal locking. I think we're going to hear about this when we discuss habitable zones in this course. And the gray zone here are stars that are too short lived, either either too short in the main sequence or or evolve quickly out from their phase like red giants are not going to stay here for many hundreds of millions of years. So you, you're left with this kind of an area here and something in this range. And by combining those, you can get this light green triangle if you're kind of liberal. But if you want to be a little bit stricter to something similar to our, our own Earth's condition, then it's the dark green area that you would call the biological HR diagram area, which is suitable for life. OK. And in Finnish, thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Harry. That was very nice. Um, we're going to take any questions. First of all, are there any questions within your own audience, uh, Harry? Yes. Yes. With the perspective of the uh, possibility for developing life, 
does the situation change as the universe gets older? So is there more and more carbon being produced and is it kind of accumulating and is it going to be eventually a carbon dominated universe? The, the, the process of forming these heavier elements is, is so slow. I mean, up to now we have about 1% of, of heavier elements, elements heavier than, than helium or hydrogen. For it to be carbon dominated, it's going to take many, many, many ages of the universe. I doubt it's ever going to happen. Un un unless you start building something that's carbon-based life. I mean, carbon-based in the sense that it's highly dominated by carbon. I mean, it's already quite carbon-based, and we have water, and we have we have carbon-based chemistry, which act together to form the life. But the universe is not going to be carbon-based. Okay, any more questions from the audience? Yeah. Yes. Uh, you told that uh, earlier Earth was covered with uh, melted rocks. What about smaller planets uh, like comets and uh, meteorites and asteroids? Uh, geologists found in many of meteorites um, chondritic uh, texture that um, was interpreted that interpreted. Uh, as a uh, melted stage. Was, in your opinion, <coughs> uh, smaller bodies of the uh, solar system uh, <coughs> were melted in past or not? Yes, this, 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 is a, uh, th this is a very interesting and important question. Uh, and it can be answered from, from observations done in the infrared, by studying accretion disks around other stars, other or around young stars. And we can get the spectrum of the accretion disk by making interferometric observations using the 8 meter telescopes in ESO. And what they show is that the central parts of the accretion disks are about 1500 to 2000 kelvins. And, and the maximum temperature they, they reach is the melting point of the silicates. So yes, there were molten rocks in the accretion disk. So it sounds something like maybe asteroids even that were molten on the in, inner edge of the accretion disk. Any more questions? I think that's that's it for our questions over here. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to move to Gerda to see if she has any questions. Yeah, hello, Harry. Hi, Gerda. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Um, I have a question on the early Earth. You said the early Earth at the beginning was molten rock, and then somehow uh, water rained down or so it was high temperature. Could you es estimate about the time when the Earth became clement for life, when you think that life could have started? Does it fall together with the microfossil uh, date or was it earlier? So, so when, when, when did the Earth cool down so that oceans were formed? Uh, I haven't seen any, any solid calculations on this. But that might be something I could try to give as a as a master's thesis study for one of my students. That would be an interesting thing. It's not a very complicated calculation, but that's something that that we could try to do here. I think we're not talking about we're not talking about hundred millions of years, but we're talking more about maybe uh, maybe hundred thousand years and and. And the reason for that is that the Earth cools down by infrared radiation. If you have a thick atmosphere, that's, that's the most effective way of cooling down. And once the temperature falls down to 200 degrees, that's when 
at the high air pressure, that's when you get the saturation pressure of water and it starts raining. And when when the then continents start to form or volcanoes start to form, that's going to be a different issue because you're going to need that maybe for the formation of life. You may need some solid ground. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I look forward to the master series. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Gerda. Uh, we're going to move now to University of Naples. You're now live. Do you have any questions for Harry? No, no, no questions here. Thank you. No questions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Viterbo. Where are we? Thank you, John. Thanks. Raffaele. Raffaele. Can you hear? Me? Raffaele, can you hear me? Maybe he has some problems with the phone. No, but you we can hear you now. Do you have any questions? No, no questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let's go back to St. Petersburg. Do you have any questions for St. Petersburg? No, not, not right now. Thank you very much, uh, Harry and Gerda. Thank you very much, Natalia. We switch to uh, University of Szczecin in Poland. Do you have any questions for Harry? Uh, yes, we have uh, uh, well, at least one question. Now, this is uh, um, Adam Watzner from the University of Szczecin. Let me pass. Uh, hello, thank you for a very nice lecture. I have actually three questions. Uh, first one, uh, how was the evolution of these prime uh, first generation uh, stars? First generation stars, we have not observed any first generation stars, so so the evolution is sort of uh, speculatory at this point. At that time, we don't have any metal, so, so we have hydrogen and helium, which means that we can form very large stars. And at present, the size of the stars is mainly limited by the cooling of the metals. At the time, that time, there were no metals, so we can form big stars, and, and that's one way of explaining the, the carbon monoxide we see in the early universe. Mm. And uh, there's also a suggestion that some Small stars were formed at that time, and, and they may be still floating around here. So people are looking for these extremely low metal stars, which may be uh, red dwarfs from, from the, actually from population three. But this, this study, study is quite young at this, this phase. Mm. And the second is, uh, why the greenhouse effect? Uh, why, why the greenhouse effect uh, didn't cause that Earth followed the evolution of Venus? Why the, the Earth uh, didn't become the became become the second uh, Venus? Uh, right. Then, yes, that, that, that's a, that's a very important question for for actually for the formation of life. Why, why didn't Earth follow Venus and be get this runaway greenhouse effect because because we also had high carbon dioxide and that's possible because we had oceans here and mm. once land started forming here volcano we started getting erosion and, and this carbon dioxide went down into the mantle mm. by the erosion and it got got off the atmosphere so you you have you have high carbon dioxide and you get strong erosion and it starts removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And this kind of creates a thermostat, the temperature starts to falling and the, and the greenhouse effect goes away. On Venus, you may not have had oceans, but they evaporated quickly, so you could not get this 
dumping of carbon dioxide into the mantle of the Earth. Ah, and uh, the last one uh, question is, uh, what is the origin of uh, water on uh, Ceres and uh, these big uh, planetoids you mentioned in your lecture? The or origin of water in Ceres, that's a good question. It, it may be partially, uh, I mean, it's possible that Ceres orbited on, on an orbit which was, which was beyond Jupiter, kind of right on the snow line. I don't know if, if it has been really well studied why, why Ceres has so much water in it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, uh, there are no much more. There are no more questions uh, here at the University of Szczecin. So thanks, all, thanks all to speak. Uh, thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Harry. I will, unless there's anything else you need to add. No, I, I don't think I need to add anything else except that thank you for everybody who came up with questions. Thank you indeed. Yes, very nice questions. Um, I will pass them back to myself. Um, thanks very much to Gerda, to Francois, and for Harry uh, for their presentations today. I will quickly ask Gerda if there's any more uh, comments that she wants to add uh, before we sign off and uh, close the first session of this academic year 2012-2013. Gerda, do you have anything to add? It's a wonderful start again and uh, I look forward to listen to all the other uh, lectures. Thank you. I would like to thank Francois and, and uh, Nigel especially for taking the initiative to do it again and I wish you all a lot of success and I hope the students will enjoy it very much.